not too long ago, at the time of this recording, the Open Gaming License 1.0a was under severe attack by Wizards of the Coast. Apparently that's been resolved by now, but I think it taught everyone a valuable lesson, and that is, corporations can't be trusted, and also, that gaming is bigger than just D&D. As many people, and in fact possibly most people, recognize, you don't need anybody's permission to play a game at home, nor to write an adventure that happens to work with, say, for instance, just coming up with a name here, D&D 5th Edition. Don't copy 5e rules verbatim, and you can write rules that just so happen to work with 5th Edition. And you don't need a license, you don't need permission. Here's a little game design exercise. For instance, say you want to invent a mini-game for 5th Edition, or for a game and you want it to work with 5th edition. You want a quick way to let your players gamble. So you flavor the game as a, a card game, like Blackjack. Call it Knucklejack. The first draft of the rules goes something like this. 1. The dungeon master rolls a d6. Each player rolls a d20 and adds the result to the DM's roll. 2. Any player proficient in sleight of hand may add or subtract their proficiency bonus to their roll. 3. The player closest to 21, but not over, wins. Okay, not bad. Uh, there's a lot of 5e lingo in there, though. Whether or not phrases like Dungeon Master and Sleight of Hand and Proficiency Bonus intrude upon any company's trademarks is probably debatable, but they definitely lend the appearance that your minigame only works in a specific system. By tying your minigame to D&D 5th edition, you're actually limiting your potential audience. Sure, most game masters can translate the code from one system to another, but why introduce that dependency when it's not required? Here's a second draft that's essentially universal. The game master rolls a d6. Each player rolls a d20 and adds the result to the GM's roll. Any player who's skilled in deception, dexterity, pickpocketing, or similar may add to or subtract from their roll using the relevant skill or stat bonus. The player closest to, but not over, 21 wins. That's pretty generic fully compatible with D&D 5th edition, just by chance, but also with Pathfinder 1, Project Black Flag, Pathfinder 2, 13th Age, Swords and Wizardry, and a lot more. Heck, you could even go a step further and remove the specifics about the kinds of die you want the players to roll. The players don't have to roll a d20. The goal doesn't even have to be 21. 1. The Game Master rolls a house die, usually a d4 or a d6. Each player rolls a knucklejack die, usually a d20, 2d10, or 3d6, and adds the result to the GM's roll. 2. Any player skilled in deception, dexterity, pickpocketing, or similar may add to or subtract from their role using the relevant skill or stat bonus. 3. The result closest to the maximum possible value of the knucklejack die wins. It's a fully universal rule supplement with no dependency on anyone's license. It can be used in a D20 system, a D6 system, a D10 system, a D100 system, doesn't matter. Suppose you want to write a rule that interacts with a specific subsystem in an existing game. For instance, maybe you're designing a spell that specifically reduces a character's passive perception. Lots of games have a concept of a spot check or something that determines whether a character has noticed something without necessarily knowing to look for it, but passive perception is a little bit unique. The game master is supposed to know everyone's passive perception and make judgments based on that number. Is it possible to create a spell that affects passive perception without being obtuse about it? In other words, you don't want to write something like this. Reduce targets in active noticing value by 1d6. Luckily, you don't have to. Sure, mechanics get names, but they're ultimately a form of theoretical machinery. In the case of passive perception, the components are 10 plus your wisdom modifier plus your perception bonus. You can target those components without treading on arguably trademarked terminology. Reduce a target's perception bonus by 1d6 when it's used for anything not requiring a dice roll. Well, the only kind of perception non-check 
that doesn't require a dice roll in D&D 5th edition is passive perception. Now, I'm not convinced, of course, that passive perception actually works all that well in 5th edition, and I actually hope Project Black Flag fixes it, but I, I digress. It doesn't, that's not the point. What about the terms? If you're worried about using everyday words in an arrangement that mimics D&D 5th edition too close for your comfort, that's fine. You can redefine terms. It might feel awkward at first, but if you do it consistently in everything you publish, then your reader eventually gets comfortable with it. In a book of traps I published with a gaming buddy of mine, we wanted to be vague about damage because we didn't know what level characters would be when they had encountered each trap, much less what system would be in use. So instead of assigning damage values, we assigned damage severity. At the beginning of the book, we specified that damage was up to the game master and gave this example for 5th edition. Mild, 1d3 to 1d4. Moderate, 1d6, 2d6, or 1d8. Serious, 3d6, 2d8, 1d12. Deadly, 6d6, 4d8, or 1d20. And then in each trap, when we talk about how much damage that trap does, we didn't use a number, we used the severity of the damage. Game masters knew to refer back to the beginning of the book, or their memory, or just their general feel, to assign a number value to that damage. We did the same thing for difficulty. I mean, we did use the term DC, but we didn't have to. We could have just used difficulty, or target, or threshold. For one system, an easy difficulty might be rolling a 5, while for another system it might be rolling a 10, or getting three hits, or whatever terminology the game master needs to slot in for the game they're running. Game terms that are just normal, everyday, single words like strength, and dexterity, constitution, and so on, those can't be trademarked because no company owns those words, but maybe you want to set your game apart from the system it happens to be compatible with, for whatever reason. It's just a matter of, estab of establishing vocabulary. For instance, suppose you had this at the start of your book. Body represents your brute strength. Agile, how agile, flexible, quick, and dexterous you are. Endure, physical fortitude or constitution. Brain measures your intellect. Astute measures your spiritual health. Exuberant, how affable, friendly, and likable you are. Now, if you're a D&D player, there's no doubt which character attribute maps to the published stats in the D&D handbook. But you haven't said it, you haven't spelled it out, it's just very, very clear. Universal isn't generic. In the end, writing content for all systems often means you get a theoretically wider audience with the same amount of effort. There's no extra cost for writing a conversion. It also means that your work can theoretically endure well past specific editions. Everything I've covered here applies equally to Pathfinder 1st Edition as it does to Pathfinder 2nd Edition, and also for Starfinder, and any number of OSR games. Most of what I've written here can be used with Shadowrun, Call of Cthulhu, and any other game that uses imaginary people and real dice. You don't have to make your adventure or supplement generic for it to be universal. Establish degrees or severity early in your publication. Let the game master translate the specifics for whatever system's being used. That's what game masters do anyway. Game masters are constantly adapting things that don't work for their gaming group. An adventure says the big bad is in the room to the left, but the game master forgot to mention there was a door on the left. So quick, move the big bad over to the room uh, to the right. Oh wait, the controls for the planet-killing bomb was in the room on the right. What am I supposed to do now that the big bad's there? Okay, so the bomb's concealed in a demi-plane inside a magical safe under the rug, right where the big bad is standing. Defeat the big bad, defuse the bomb, save the world. What's the difficulty check to defuse the bomb? Uh, DC 20? No, no, wait, this is Starfinder. Uh, DC 30. Oh, but what if my reader is playing Shadowrun? Formidable. That's it. Write for a wide audience. Write for tabletop role-playing games, not a specific system. Your ideas are too good to limit to one specific game. Open it up for everybody. Thanks for watching.